We are recording the Women Matter session of the end of November. And what did you think, Victoria? You said you thought something. You can do the oh. ticket. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I just I I um <clears throat> wanted to make sure I was early today uh, because I thought Christine would be coming today, and I I wanted to introduce her if she came, but maybe um. Are people the other Christine, the Enneagram Christine. The Enneagram Christine, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just us chickens, as somebody who used to say in my family. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, am I starting the check-in? Well, I, mm -hmm. I guess I'm talking, so. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, I loved uh, beginning with song. That was fabulous. So thank you for that, Heidi. Um, actually, I'm, I've decided that the only way I'm going to learn how to breathe, since I haven't breathed my whole life, I realized that once I started meditation, is to um, start singing again, because you can't sing if you don't breathe. <laughs> and I've noticed that now when I do sing, I have a much better, um, better, my lungs are, have expanded, which is nice, but I still forget to breathe during the course of the day. Maybe I need to sing all day. Um, my biggest check-in is that I overcame all my fears and inhibitions and I did, I, I created eight measures of original tap choreography for my class, which is a university class. So it's a very, um, it's ridiculous at my age to be, but it, this famous teacher, that's the way she's offering the class. And um, so it has all these assignments and midterm exams and all kinds of things. And I was going to cheat and because I had some videos of my, um, some of my classes in New York um, and I was going to steal some choreography from my teacher in New York because I thought probably this teacher wouldn't know it. And then I, I couldn't manage to learn it. And then suddenly I just started fooling around because I love to improvise. And then slowly but surely, um, this step created itself. So um, it's a tiny, tiny thing, but it's amazing how, how monumental it was for me. And, um, and it was so exciting that I, I decided I'm going to wear clothes every day now that are conducive for tap dancing. I'm going to start doing it every day. Well. I'll tell you in two weeks whether I succeeded in doing it every day, but it's just so fabulous. So that's my check-in and um, I'm going to pass to my little dancer daughter because I think she's coming in from a class. I like Indeed that. Dance. I am. <laughs> um, yes, I am sweaty and hungry like last time. <laughs> I might go off camera sometime and listen to the conversation later and make myself a little snack. Um, yeah, I just came from a dance class. I, last week, uh, not last week, the week, the last time we met, a few days after we met, um, I came down with a really bad cold um, and it knocked me out for about five days. And I got COVID tested towards the end of that and wasn't COVID, it was just a bad cold, which was a relief. But um, yeah, that was really hard. And I think it was my body telling me in no uncertain terms that I've been doing too much, which I knew intellectually, but I hadn't reeled myself back in enough yet. And so my body had to do it for me. Um, so I've, I've been having a hard time. I'm feeling better physically. I mean, I still occasionally I'm a little stuffy still, but um, mentally I'm having, and emotionally I'm having a hard time figuring out what to do. <laughs> and how to find balance and what, I don't know, it's kind of turns into an existential, you know, what is my purpose on the earth question, um, which maybe I don't need to answer, but, um, or can answer. Um, anyway, that's what I'm, I've been juggling. Um, I might, I've decided, I think today I wanna to take a second dance class this afternoon. So I might leave about 10 minutes early today so that I can make it on time. Um, it's, it's a class that's not usually offered. And I think today's the last day that they're offering it for this, this time period. So I want to try to catch it. It's a, a Limon modern class. Um, 
so I'm back to dancing. I didn't, I danced a little bit last week, but, but because of the sickness, I took a break. So, um, yeah, I don't know what else is there to check in. Um, this upcoming week is a holiday week for the United States because of Thanksgiving. So I'm going to try to actually take that time off. Um, and, and my little, little munchkin that I babysit <laughs> four times a week uh, is turning four next week, <laughs> which is very exciting. He's becoming more and more eloquent each day, telling stories and big imagination. So he's, he's my total joy every week to see. I don't get to see him this week, sadly, but um, yeah, I don't know. Those are, those are the updates for now. I'm going to pass to Hanali. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And I love both of you, both you and Victoria said, because I just did a dancing session two hours ago and it was wonderful as well. And last week, um, I had a very interesting experience. I was surrounded by pragmatists and it was really tough talking about, to them about visions, you know, to, about your vision and what you're busy doing um, for humanity, for yourself, for the world, just because of the joy of it. And I was like deeply deterred by it because why am I surrounded by all these pragmatists? Because they really gave me sort of, they made it tough for me. You know, they, they tried to, they were so um, skeptical and cynical and the likes. And I was like, what's going on here? And then I was invited to a bending reality session by my daughter uh, of a woman in Australia called Yemi Penn. And it was like midnight our time. And we, had, we have been having power uh, outages for the last three, four weeks, sometimes seven and a half hours a day. But it worked out so beautifully that I could attend the session. They just stopped that uh, outages to, like, literally an hour before the session. But the, I had such a shift during that session. It was so simplistic, actually, that I was just amazed. And then the next day we danced. We just did a free flow dancing thing um, just spontaneously. And it was so beautifully in the flow that I went into. So it's like as if this pragmatic <laughs> experience I had with the pragmatists, and, and the sad thing about them is two of them were, uh, very, were visionaries 10 years ago, and suddenly they are deep, deeply pragma pragmatic and the likes. Not that it's bad, it's just very interesting to see how we transform in our own lives. But the dancing and that bending reality experience was just a complete shift. And so I love also then to take breaks during the day, to just do a little bit of free flow dancing, just to get back into the flow again. So I'm glad to be here with you ladies. I just came out of a session, which was very interesting, about the holographic universe. And um, it became very um, physics-like at the end, and, but it was just beautiful again as well, in terms of wholeness, you know, the way we see parts, in the whole picture. So I'm still trying to see the whole picture with a pragmatist in my space and then this free flow and it's obviously part of a whole bigger picture. So I'm still trying to sense into that, but I'm glad to be here with you. And I'll pass on to Monia. Yeah, here it is. I wanted to share these orchids with you. I got them for my birthday. And they are just, they were just green. And now in one week they flowered and it's so beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's just beautiful. I look at them and I feel joy and happiness. Um, yeah, I'm still uh, reading Andrew Holacek uh, today about placebo effect that you really can tell your body a lot of things uh, with your mind. In hypnotism or in trances or in flow. And that's quite fascinating. The, uh, and uh, he quotes even Milton Erickson that he got young women in uh, a hypno hypnotic trance uh, to grow their breasts, <laughs> which, which is funny. <laughs> they were flat chested and hormones didn't uh, help. So he hypnotized them. Anyway, 
Um, we are still recovering from our great festival and nobody got sick afterwards, which is really a great joy to hear. And uh, yeah. I also have been reading uh, a fantasy novel for the first one of the three of a trilogy. And it's about the weirdest, oops, the weirdest things. What, what's happening to, ah, here it is. The weirdest uh, new words, uh, a universe. Uh, I'm always amazed how these, it's a woman, a black woman, how they create the whole universe in such minute details. Um, it's called, huh, it's called the fifth season. And actually the fifth season is death, apocalypse. And the characters are just, uh, yeah. So you really, when you read it, you are in a different universe. And, uh, Take a look at it in, in on Amazon, but there is no description of the contents, just but uh, read the commentaries, they are quite interesting. Um, so compared with Andrew Holacek, that everything we see and touch and think is just illusory. Reading a novel like this is, Illusory, illusory, but it's quite, quite, yeah, a challenge. And my dreams have become not lucid yet, but I, uh, I very uh, politely asked for assistance, <laughs> and I sort of dreamt. Uh, Oh, how should I put it? It was an explanation of how we dream. And uh, it's that it's just uh, the brain is the most creative thing we have. And at night, it doesn't just stop, it continues. And uh, if you feel like you're on a stage, uh, which I was in my dream, uh, and to deliver some something, some lines. Uh, yeah, it's all created by yourself, your dreams and your reality. So this is what we really have to face and accept. And so we don't have to be miserable, we can be joyful, just the same. If we are up to it. Heidi, you're checking. My check in. As I said before, I had a nice yoga lesson before and I could feel my body from the inside out. And that I, I actually used the first time the word that I feel as if there is, my body is sort of hollow and it's in light inside. That was a, a, a good feeling. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's less easy to come into this perspective, let's say, position, however you want to say it was nice and then in the morning i studied with the italian with the children and as i said before using songs for to for them to remember the the words but classical songs classical did i tell you already that i had them watch uh, don giovanni and they really watched it they really watched it i mean amazing i thought i would uh, with the girls try to start La Zellina, Vedrai Carino, no? Vedrai Carino, se se bonino. Because at least one of the girls is, is always, ah! so she's singing like cholera tours, imitating these uh, singers. So, and she has a quite a clean voice. So she's nine. So I, I will see what will come out. Anyway, it, I'm still enjoying the, the kids. And yeah. It's life is interesting and it, I'm always arrive at the evening. I say, oh, it's already evening and I'm really tired. But the day, where did it go? It's sort of like in, a, in flow, you know, it's just <laughs> passing. I don't know how, how that happens. 
from what you said, I had heard several things. One was, I love this, uh, what you said, um, I think, uh, Haneli, bending the universe. I love <laughs> No, bending reality, bending reality. And uh, then I also heard the power of the mind. And I heard Beatrice with finding balance. So we have quite a bit of, of possibilities to talk about what is, what, let me see, hypnotic states also. That's a good, uh, a good topic. Holographic universe, you said, Haneli. Um, so if I can ask you a question, it might not be the final topic, but what is the holographic, holographic universe? Would you like me to answer that, or is that just a yeah. quick? Yeah, just a quick, uh, you know, in in a nutshell, a book like this in a nutshell. So, so I'll try to condense it because, like I say, it's somebody else who spoke about it. And I was just present to that, and he spoke about it a lot before when I was in his, in some of the sessions. And the way he's, he, he speaks about it is that there is no objective universe. We all see a perspective of the universe. And so you, you don't also have a combined one because, because our perspectives are so such a variety, you can't, me and you can't see, see it as a combined one. It's almost impossible because we only have the perspective that we see in a specific moment. So then he explains about an apple. Um, and then he goes deeper into what an apple could be mean for us. So he first goes into the symbolism of what an apple could mean for us. And then he also refers to it as an apple in terms of a teacher standing in a classroom and she has an apple on her desk. So he, he was relating it to those two. Monia, did you want to say something? <laughs> My camera just keeps no know, oscillating. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was, um, so it's that, so he was trying to show that these different perspectives, one from a symbolic perspective, what the apple could mean for one person versus somebody teaching children about an apple and we eating an apple. It's very different perspectives. But in one moment, we will have memory of all of them, of most probably of all three in some sense, but we, we don't have a combined one of all, human, all of the humans on earth seeing that apple and what it means to them and what, how they, uh, when it comes into awareness, is it memory that's coming up that makes an association with it? So what we're speaking about is the, 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 the whole versus the part. So when we see something, we only see the part of it. And because we look at it from different perspectives, it's it's it it has it has it has a holographic perspective. It's a holographic perspective of what's really there. Does it make sense? I'm still also trying to understand how to explain it very easily, because <laughs> he's he's about it in terms of quantum physics. Um, do I understand right what holographic is? I thought holographic is that in the part is the whole thing. Is it that one? No. Yes. So how is this then it's, combining? It's part, it's, it, it's part of it. It's part of it. So the whole, so it's not reductionist thinking. Where mm -hmm. reductionist thinking is about the part, holographic thinking is about the whole. But that whole is not objective. So we can't say there's one universe that we all experience because we only all see a different part at a specific moment in time, space, reality because we look at it from a different perspective. And even if we should, if I hold something like my phone to you, you can only see one side of it. I see the back side of it. And in the, in the, in the um, Zoom, I can also see the front one through the camera. But at whatever is at the back, you can't see right now. So the holographic universe is, is the universe which holds all these perspectives? Yes. Okay, thank you. Interesting. So uh, we can go to another topic. I was just curious what that what that meant. You you decide. 
what is most burning. Somebody has something really burning. Well, how about how we form our reality? How we... Uh, I also read uh, in Holacek that memory is always just a confabrication of associations of what happened. So, um, yeah. So what do we build our reality on? How does this sound to you, American girls? Um, yes, I think that's a, I mean, that's a huge subject. We could do Women Matters for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I, think since Mo, I think since Monia contributed the beautiful flowers, um, she should have first say today. And, and I loved it, Monia, that your, um, your clothes and the screens behind, it's all this like this perfect um, symbiosis, not symbiosis, but this harmony of colors. If Whistler, if Whistler were alive and painting, he would call it, he would paint you and call it harmony and white and green. green. Or something. <laughs> white and green, yeah. Yeah, it's just... I guess they influence me somehow. It's, but uh, I had this, I wore this when I got them and also the silver, uh, and there is some silver on here. So it's Christmassy already a little. And Perfect. It's just beautiful. It's just beauty, pure beauty. And uh, yeah, maybe we should really go into beauty, visual or audible or whatever you do, uh, can produce much more. The reality of beauty. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's what I thought. Beatrice, is it okay for you? <laughs> it's, no, it's great. It's, I mean, it's big. I, <laughs> I don't know if my brain is sharp enough yet, but, but I will, things will come up. Things will emerge, they always do. Well, maybe you have a bite to eat first and then you add some coffee. I think that'll help. <laughs> It helps me all the time. <laughs> the reality of hunger. The reality, the reality of hunger. How well, do you construct your hunger? <laughs> the reality of your hunger. <laughs> Not so, much to uh, construct, I guess. <laughs> uh, from, for me, beauty is visual. Uh, first, that's my first and dominant sense. Uh, beauty in listening, I'm, I'm more susceptible to. I can't, uh, when I look at something, I can differentiate me still, but then I go into non-dual uh, being. Uh, with listening with music, it's from the start, you can't separate. I can't separate myself from music. And which also means when I really get into one song, it keeps going on and on, even in my dreams, it's there. And then it continues and uh, until I stop it with a mantra, but it's, it's really, this is the basic. So I really can't separate myself from music. Smelling and tasting has sort of reduced ever since my aneurysma and so I'm not, no longer bothered by that very much. And I'm, not, and I'm not trapped by that as well, because I do feel it's also a trap somehow when you really go into beauty, uh, it can become a trap in my opinion right now. That's how I feel at present. If it, it may be the most exciting and the most beautiful thing but somehow it traps you. It, or at least I get attached to it, attached to beauty. And that's, that's for me a trap. Okay, I pass on to whoever feels trapped as well. 
I wanted to ask Beatrice, uh, but she is eating probably now, uh, about the beauty of movement, of feeling, of sensing. But I, I imagine that who is dancing, I'm not dancing, but that uh, you can feel this in some way. Not see it, I also see it in other people, but the beauty in yourself when you move, how does this express? I don't know if I think of it as beauty, but there's certainly a, there's certainly a feeling of deep expression. I, yeah, I have to think about that. I'll think about that. I'll get a snack to think about that and I'll, I'll return and <laughs> continue to listen. <laughs> okay. Stay on camera. The, the other dancers, the beauty, I, for me, it can be beauty because if you know, you feel your body and you know that it is beautiful in certain moments, no? certain movements, at least some very few times it happened to me because I'm not a dancer. What about you? <laughs> Are you asking Beatrice still? She's gone now, I think, for the moment. No, also um, you, Hanali. Well, I, I can say that for me, it's, it, it binds it all together. The reason I'm so passionate about tap dancing is that for me, it's um, the perfect combination of music and um, the, the, it's the movement of the body. It's it's the music, the the rhythms of the sounds. It's the connection between the like the the tactile sense of it, and the. It, I mean, it's very very visceral, and at the same time, it's like um, you know playing the drums. It has this. I don't know. It's it's very primal somehow. It's very. Um, it's. Actually, I mean, it's, I think it's the most primal form of dancing in some way. Well, I don't know why I even say that, but, but there's something about it that's very, um, it's very grand, it has this relationship to the earth that's very interesting because it's, it's, it's the, the, the earth itself, the ground becomes an instrument. I don't know. It's, so it's very, um, It, it to me it kind of encompasses so many different fields it's and and being a musician yeah i i agree with what monia said about music because that's how i experience it too but i guess what i was actually just talking um to a friend of mine about the difference between musicians i know who love the instrument that they play more than music itself like they became um they became musicians because they loved the actual active, the physical activity, and they're very passionate about. It. So those are the people, of course, who succeed because they practice twenty hours a day because they love the feel of it and the and the coordination and all those things. So it's a it's a body, well, it's intellect and body together, um, versus the people who for whom it's the music and they're just trying to find any means to get to express the music itself. So that to me is interesting too, like physical, the beauty of physical engagement of the body and the beauty that's somehow ephemeral and, and more like in the realm of the spirit. But Hanali, I'm gonna to pass to you because I think now we're moving into your territory because of, of where both of these come, the bending of reality. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Victoria and Monia. Yeah, um, to put it into words, it's for me also very sensory, visceral, but it's almost as if all my senses work together at the same time. It's not one single one to, um, that I can say is, it's <clears throat> dominant. They're all present, almost ever present, depending on what my mood is in my state of being, you know, am I tired? Am I, have I slept well? Um, have I moved? Because I'm also, I have to move a lot, but the beauty for me is being, be, noticing and witnessing something is when my body feels aligned to that. So I'm, so my body is almost like a tuning fork 
and it entrains them to that movement. Or if I see be something beautiful uh, visually, my body responds to that, that visual effect. So almost all the things you mentioned, Victoria, the rhythm, the tone of music specifically, movement too, it's almost as if there's a chord struck somewhere in my, in my being that reminds me of the beauty of life itself in some way. And then my body responds to that in an expressive way, you know, sensory exhilaration, or, or um, it can also be tears, be soul tears, because it's so beautiful. You just go into, into tears because it's, it just strikes you on such a deep level that uh, and it can be something very simple, you know, it could be an ant walking on the, on the grass, you know, on, outside on the ground, and you see them carrying the load, and your mind can't compute how is that small little creature carrying this big load, um, which to us is, mon you know, minuscule. So it could be very interesting things. It depends on where I put my attention in a specific moment. But there is something, in, there is an impulse as well that sort of drives to not only observe and experience in that way, but also to create it. So it's almost like the receptive and the um, creative sides of myself wants to have more of that. It wants to make more of that that it's perceiving. And it, it goes beyond reverence because it's on some level, sometimes it's, it's like Eumonia with that beautiful orchid there. It's just looking at the orchid. So if I isolate the orchid, it's, it's just, it draws me. There's a drawing, there's a magnetizing force to it as well. It is so beautiful. And then you together in that picture, in that holographic picture now, Monia, then it's that whole picture as well, because your smile, your, the way you sit, your, your calmness, the way you speak, then becomes, then I feel it in my legs because then it's very grounded, very earthy. And I've always been fascinated about the term beauty <laughs> and what it means for other people. And yeah, it's something inside me that connects it to flow on some level, you know. Um, there's no obstruction, this flow of life in whatever form it might be. It might be a staccato dance, you know, it doesn't need to be a flowing dance, for example. It could be a very um, pointy posture as well, but I can, you can still feel the flow if that makes sense. I'm complete for now. But I just want to mention I'm a voice person as well. I just, voices just draw me. And I had the most amazing experience last week to um, get to know a, a artist, a voice artist who sings like birds. He makes nature sounds, he's, he's Russian. And then synchronistically yesterday, my daughter sent me because I shared with my daughter and another friend. And yesterday, but he makes sounds that you can't, you can't, your brain can't compute it, but you can feel it. He takes you to such a deep place inside of yourself. And then yesterday, my daughter introduced me to another Russian lady who's doing similar things. And it's not sounds that, you know, it's more a toning thing that she's doing, but it, it goes to such a deep level in your soul that, it, this, you, 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 yeah, it's just you want to be there with her. You want to touch her. You want to feel her when she's doing this. Because I want to feel her body. What's happening to her body when she's doing this? Because it's so outworldly. It's just incredible. And that in one week, these two people came on my path. And yeah, if you listen to him, it's just incredible. It's just incredible. How, and his connection with the earth, it is so intense and deep through these sounds that he's making because he's mimicking the earth's voice in ways that we can't sometimes hear with our ears. Something I learned about um, in, when, in my undergraduate degree in dance um, was about the concept of mirror neurons, which I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and 
the basic idea, I mean, of course, it's, it's <laughs> probably more complicated, more scientific um, if you really research it. But the basic idea is that when we observe another person doing a physical movement or doing something, that something inside of our body can echo what that movement feels like, even if we're not actually doing it, that, that we're, our body wants to do it or knows what it feels like to some degree, um, which is very interesting. And which is also why if you really are invested in watching a dance performance, for example, that there's that, that kind of empathic relationship that you get with the performer, or it can be kind of cathartic to watch because in some ways you are participating in the experience. I mean, you have to be really, you know, connected and paying attention. I think there's many other levels to it, but I've always found that very interesting that, that we're, we can be participating with something even if we're sitting completely still. Um, so I wanted to share that. I'm gonna keep eating, but I'm here. I was struck by what you said, the otherworldly um, sounds. When we think about this overtone singing, no, at the beginning we didn't know that, and it's to me it seemed like otherworldly, and I understand that the Gregorianic singing is also based on overtones, and that's this special quality, you know, when you hear these monks sing in a big cathedral. That's I remember when I was only maybe twenty or something. I came into the Duomo of uh, the uh, of, of of Strasbourg, and there was a choir singing in this way, and it was like, you know, like, huh? This is also beauty. <laughs> I'm trying to remember that Indian saying. It ends in "I walk in beauty, beauty above me." Beauty below me, beauty before me. Uh, I walk in beauty. I have to look it up and find it again. So, but that's what, yeah, that's open to us all the time. And that doesn't mean that you are busy, busy, busy putting things in the place and then the flower there and the flower there and the piece of something there. That's, I don't think that is meant with this, the path of beauty, you know, the, you, you are all the walking the beauty path, Haneli. So it is, it can be perceived these things as beauty, but what we are talking about, I think it's another level of of, of beauty and not this, which is like publicity or like these beautiful homes, you know, that's all sterile. That's not what it means. I think um, going back to something Monia said earlier, um, and this, it's exactly what I've been um, studying lately in Buddhism is this, um, the, um, you know, the, 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 the sorrows, the suffering that comes from grasping or aversion and how you have to get beyond that. And it, and it makes me think of how my mother um, was incredibly sensitive to beauty of every in every form even if it was like um you know a delicious taste of the the palate but i remember um something she always would say when i'd take her down to see the sunset over the ocean she if it was a particularly beautiful sunset she'd say oh it's so beautiful what what can i do she would say and she would just be in such a frustration I can't eat it. I can't hold it. You know, it was this desire, and and I feel that so much. I, I I keep remembering it when I go and see the sunset over the ocean. That sometimes it's or or the rising full moon the other night, this huge, luscious orange autumn moon, and I I wanted to hold it. It was like Faust, you know. Oh, Augenblick verweile dich, du bist so schön. You know, it's this 
And, um, and that's the evanescence of beauty that we have to, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, like as a mother wanting, you know, you, you, you just love your child so much. You just want to like devour your child or suffocate it, but you, of course you can't, and you have to let it go. So it's this, this, the, the beauty has to stay free somehow to really be appreciated. And if we, as soon as we try to grab it, you know, it's like trying to grab a butterfly or, or and that's where music for me is such a good, um, a good lesson for us. I feel like music is, is for everyone um, because it's somehow not graspable. It can, it can help us to develop that, that relationship where we're not having to hold on to it because it, you know whereas like if we have an object like a beautiful painting or a sculpture or um you know then there's that like I've known so many art collectors through my life and um and I've asked them you know what is it that drives you to be a collector and it's always possession they always say the same thing all the collectors they want to know that they own it, it's theirs, even if it's even if they never intend to sell it. It's not about necessarily about like the monetary value, but that sense of like, it's mine. I own it, I have it, I can do anything I want with it. So that's again, that grasping, um, which has always intrigued me because I would hate to be an art collector. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> it's interesting because art, you can, I, even the sun that said you can watch it and stay there quite a while. Music is moving all the time. You have heard the sound and then it's gone. So in music is only uh, a development itself by time, in time. So you cannot grasp it. You can remember then the melody, but you, you cannot, if you have one sound, it's only one sound, that's not yet music. But you can grasp only one sound, maybe, no? One moment. So that's very really interesting that you cannot grasp it. I haven't thought about that in this terms. Thank you, Victoria. Well, just this morning, just before this, um, I've I've found this um, global community called Sangha Live. And um, <clears throat> every single day, they somebody offers an hour of um, meditation and a Dharma talk and everything. And um, and the one who's doing it this week, she she rang a you know she she had a singing bowl, and she had this really amazing singing bowl, the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. I mean, this very rich, deep, and this long, long, endless decay of sound. I mean, just went on and on and on, and and it made me think of that. So it's perfect. I mean, it's it's synchronicity that we're talking about because as I was listening to that decay and how you know the with mindfulness you you're you you're holding on to it you're following it and following it and following it until it dissolves into silence again but but that sense of the passage of time it's it's it, and like you I thought of it just now because you said one sound you know um is not yet music and that's true in the traditional sense but in the sense of this singing bowl it's, it actually is one tone but it's gradually um diminishing in volume but it's i don't know it's it's a beautiful i suddenly thought this morning i thought what a beautiful um image for everything you know in in this life that I, it's you know suddenly i thought oh that's that's the meaning of the singing bowl <laughs> that's why they have them you know And even there, if it's only one tone and it's degrading, I remember the feeling, oh, it should go on, it should go on, it should go on. Oh, even there, you want to, to keep it, you know? So is this the condition of life that we want always to keep everything, every moment, every feeling, good feeling, not the other ones, we don't want to keep these? Well, I think that's, for me, that's the, the appeal of the Faust legend, 
I think, and that's why it's 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 continued. You know, it's it's something that's so intrinsically part of human nature. I think everyone can relate to it, and I think that's why the that legend has persisted over centuries and centuries because it's it's so common. I mean, I still go into total mourning at the end of breakfast every 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 day. It's like, oh no, now there's no more breakfast <laughs> until tomorrow. But maybe that's because I'm fasting too. <laughs> Break fast, it's really a big deal these days. <laughs> I'm thinking that it is connected to what we are living, the wanting to hold on to something, you know, also the state of the world. So everybody tries to hold on on their ideas, on their, I don't know what, you know, on their uh, concepts of life and what is right and wrong. That seems to be human nature to want to, not to change, <laughs> and let it go, not to what, want to let things go. Well, on that note, I have to let this call go. <laughs> um, thank you all. Um, I have to head out because it uh, takes 45 minutes to get there in the classes and 50 minutes. <laughs> so thank you all. You are the beauty in my life. And um, I look forward to hearing what, what else you say in this call. I'll, I'll listen to the recording later. And um, I'll see you in two weeks. And think of me dancing. <laughs>
if that's you know what we're if that's the highest you know goal then you know why why do we even have the census in the first place and furthermore how do you know if you've achieved mindfulness beyond mindfulness if if it's beyond mindfulness how can you define it as mindfulness beyond mindfulness because in order to define it you have to still be in mindfulness or you can't you know anyway and he just kind of um you know treated me like a kindergartner and just sort of waved it aside but he said um well if you haven't experienced it how can i describe it to you and i said well my point is not that but rather how can one possibly describe it if it's beyond description you know that you get anyway um but then he finally said um when i kind of tried to pin him down he said oh it's this you know this this luminosity this transcendent light and luminosity and then he just sort of left it at that and i don't know it it, it still kind of sits with me because i think to myself well what is it that we love about light you know isn't when we even talk about light we're we're thinking of something visual even if it's visual in a in a conceptual way anyway it's, I, i'm going way <laughs> i'm still kind of mulling over this whole thing um but that that for me is the challenge is like to because i think the greatest way to live and to appreciate life and to be grateful for life and live in a sense of awe and wonder and gratitude is to use the senses we've been endowed with it doesn't make sense to me to to sort of ban them from our existence well, but not to grasp so it's that it's that that balance between reveling in all the senses and yet remaining remaining free so that there's a there's a give and take there's a fluidity there's a there's a i mean even being in the flow i know that with music as soon as i fixate myself when i'm performing on something specific then i then i i'm out of the flow and it's over so it's that beautiful sense of of kind of the self like not being there but still being able to be part of the fabric of the beauty somehow it's all right monia is going to explain it better i can see uh, i was just grinning because you always pin them down those enlightened men or at least you try to and maybe uh, luminosity is different for women and accept that victoria you you they are their kind of enlightenment is different and it's the only way they have because they never give birth to anything with their bodies uh, so they have to get into the mental sphere it, that's what i uh, what i the first the first time i came about that was uh, when uh, i asked what uh, the man tries to get enlightened by tantric uh, getting a hold of the tantric energies and what does the woman have or the, what can the woman gain by this well she gets orgasms that's what i heard and i said my 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 it can't be so uh yeah women have a different approach to luminosity and and uh and i guess it's for me it's the fuller the holographic <laughs> approach and not the mental approach only because yeah. uh, hmm? I, i have also a question when they talk about luminosity that's it so they have to perceive it in some way mm -hmm. you know that's what i i uh, ask myself i mean for me light is something which i somehow see probably not with my eyes but somehow it comes to your senses inner senses mixed senses whatever but it's still a perception and when you say that's luminosity and say it's not outside of perception it, i just can't get it i i mean exactly. i don't know how they can say it <laughs> well that's why that's why i tried to pin him down but well where i challenged him and i think that's what sent him into such a rage was um 
in, in mysticism, they have the apophatic and the cataphatic and the apophatic is the, is the call, well, it's also called the via negativa and cataphatic is the via positiva. So the, the apophatic theology, regardless of whether, I mean, it's mysticism in any spiritual tradition, but he seemed to struggle with it. But anyway, that's another thing, um, is the acknowledgement that you can't, you can't actually like describe God. How could you possibly? So, so you, you rest in this, in this, it's like the dark night of the soul. You rest in this, um, this understanding that it's beyond, it's beyond description. It's beyond, you can't pin it down, but that's exactly the beauty of it. And then the cataphatic is if you want to like, you know, define it and analyze it and chop it into pieces and look at it and find words and images and sounds that all describe this thing. Um, but, but what you said, Monia, I was just, of course, when you spoke, I thought of, of Heidi though, who um, is a woman and it, it's not necessary to actually give birth, to have children, to have this other, I mean, I think there, I, I definitely think there's a difference between the genders um, and all this, the, the bending reality and bending genders. <laughs> um, I think we're all on that, that huge spectrum of, of gender. And um, sure enough, the, the men that I know who identify as men who are particularly artistic and creative and sensitive and have this kind of poetic nature, are, you know, most of them are gay. And it's, to me, it's no coincidence because they, they have, they have a, a preponderance of these, you know, feminine qualities and attributes. And that's why then to the outside world, they appear very effeminate because that, that's actually who they are. I mean, they're on, so I think in this spectrum, whether it's overtly male and female or not, I think there definitely is a difference. There's there's a kind of like like the yin and yang. Mm -hmm. That's that's really what it is. Is the and I think with the yang, it's always this like, you know, it has to be like this, you know. And they, there's a different way of perceiving. Uh, I just connected giving birth to what Hanili said about surrender, because mm. you have to surrender whatever happens, whatever your body does. You can't control it with your mind in that moment. And this is an experience uh, that really taught me a lot. And uh, yeah. Yeah. But of course you can surrender in many different ways, as you just said, Victoria. Yeah. I actually have to, check out myself because I have another appointment at 10 um, and it's a medical appointment so they're not they're ruthless oh. <laughs> so let's do the check out I think what we talked about what we can use as a title is beauty and spirituality mm. yeah. Yeah. okay it was an unexpected beautiful talk <laughs> no it wasn't I expected already that it's beautiful whenever we meet. <laughs> Victoria, I just have one question for you. Can you see the beauty in what Alan said to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Great. Well, I have to say, I have to say when he was so ruthless um, <laughs> and he was just, uh, he, well, it's a long story, but, but when he at one point he got so enraged that he, he he literally like his face became bright red i mean it was all you know it was on zoom mm -hmm. but um but i thought oh so he's human after all he can actually get enraged he's not the perfect enlightened buddhist but but he has what i did then it's funny you asked that is i focused really really intensely on his hands because he has the most beautiful um, I don't know if you if you look him up online, if, if you can see pictures of him with his hands, these long, beautiful tapering fingers. He would have made a fabulous um, musician. Maybe he mm -hmm. is, who knows? But anyway, <laughs> on that note. <laughs> uh, but I read up that I'm anger is I... topic. Uh, to, uh, to how to deal with anger, that's the topic he has been 
uh, has been following him his whole life. What mm -hmm. I read about him. About um, whom? Uh, you just mentioned uh, the uh, Alan, Alan Wallace. Yeah. No, the one was the oh the, Donald Rothberg. Yeah. yeah, Donald Rothberg. Yeah, conflict. I read up yeah. about Donald Rothberg, yeah. and his anger is the top his topic. Right. And you yeah, are the yeah. perfect trigger. <laughs> 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 okay, girls. See you in two weeks. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Even not having done the perfect check out, everybody, but I think thank you is enough today. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>